أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه وسيد رسله سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من عمل صالحا من ذكر وأنثى وهو مؤمن فلنحيينه حياة طيبة Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim For the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, the acceptance of the deeds And for the hastening of the reappearance of baqiyatillahi al-a'zam ruhi wa arwahul alameen alahu al-fida in latin your souls Purify your atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Respected scholars, elders, sisters, and brothers in Islam, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. Lady Hudayf was the wife of Imam Ali al Hadi and the mother of Imam al Hassan al Askari, Salawatullahi wa Salaamu Alaihim Ajma'in. Allahumma Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Without a shadow of a doubt, an outstanding individual who had a particular title unique to her. She was known as Al Jadda, the grandmother, in honor of the fact that she was indeed the grandmother of the awaited Savior, Sahib Al Asri Wa Zaman, Al Mahdi Al Muntadar, Ajjar Allah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. Today, there are a number of names given to the mother of Imam al-Askari. She is known as Salil. She is also known as Sousan. Together with a number of other names, we find that this lady at the same time is the subject of much praise by our ulama. Because unlike the other mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt at that time, she emerged and she had a leadership position within the community. Please understand this. Because without a shadow of a doubt, if you look around the world today within the school of Ahl al-Bayt and you ask them, who is Salil? Who is Hudayth? Did she have a leadership role? Can you tell me anything about her? Identify her? You'll find maybe, and I'll boldly say 99% of people would say I have never heard her name before. The recognition, however, is today the discussion of the life of this great lady, the mother of Amal Askari, has relevance to a number of areas into our lives today, especially the role of women and whether a female can become a marja. Because when you look at this particular honorable individual, what do you find? You find that she was from the area of Noba, Nubia. As we said, a number of other ladies, mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt, such as Lady Sosan, or for example, Tuktam, the mother of Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam, were She's from the same area, from the area that was known as southern Egypt, modern-day Sudan. We don't know of the way and the detail by which this lady, who was also a slave, bondswoman, ended up marrying whom? Ended up marrying Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. However, we are aware of the praise of whom? Of Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam for her. Like many other women, mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt, the praise of the Ahl al-Bayt themselves is indicative and it's sufficient to come to the conclusion of her nobility, of her outstanding characteristic. Shaykh al-Majlisi, Allah Ta'ala Maqamah, says that she was virtuous, she was noble, she had qualities that made her amongst the best females of her time, something that other scholars also agree. What did Imam al-Hadi say about his wife? He said, Sulayl sullat min kulli afa. His wife, Sulayl, or Hudayth, she has been what? She has been protected from every form of harm. Wa'aha wa min kulli ritsin wa najasa. 
and she is indeed immune from all forms of impurities. This idea of afa, the harm to something, is interesting because we have a narration from the Holy Prophet, Rasul al A'zam Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To help us understand what Imam al Hadi says about his wife. He says, My wife, Sulayl or Hudayf, she is protected from every form of what? Impurity. Subhanallah. What a description by Ma'asum about a female, about a person that he is, of course, marrying. This particular uh, description, Af, uh, is found in the hadith of the Holy Prophet according to the narration where he says, Ya Ali. He describes that everything, most of the things that you and I do are potential to be harmed, spoiled. There is a potential for it to somehow be impacted negatively. He says, Ya Ali, Afatul Hadith al Kadib. He says, Speech, what it can be harmed by is lying, deception. And what knowledge can be indeed affected negatively, forgetfulness. What is al-fatra? It says what ibadah can be affected with is weakness, dhu'af. The deformity or what impacts beauty is what is what's known as khayla, and that's ujub, to be too much self-centered, admiration of oneself. And finally he says, وَآفَةُ الْعِلْمِ hasad. And here once again, ilm is mentioned. He says, what indeed weakens knowledge is envy. The last ilm here the Prophet is mentioning is in regards to those who have degrees, high degrees of ilm, meaning the ulama. Yes, what is really problematic sometimes the Prophet of Islam indicates is what weakens a scholar is when they display and exhibit envy with regards to others who may indeed have this knowledge. And that is why Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in a narration he's, it is said that after Ghuslud Jumu'ah, this Ghuslud Jumu'ah is highly recommended on a day like tomorrow, yes, to the extent that even if you perform it on uh, Friday night, or even on Saturday, you can do it with the intention of qada, and you will get the thawab, and indeed it covers the wudu. This particular ghuslul jumu'ah, yes, is highly recommended. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, when you do ghuslul jumu'ah, afterwards say, Allahumma tahir qalbi min kulli afa. Ya Allah, I need help. There are these things that weaken my deeds, such as, for example, lying, such as, for example, what? Jealousy. He says, Tahir qalbi min kulli afatin tumhiqu deeni wa tubtilu amali. These deformities eradicate my faith. They make my deed not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Imam al Hadi alayhi salam says, Look at this lady, yes? She's been protected from all these negative traits that impacts you and I. And he says, Sayahibu Allahu hujjatahu ala khalqihi yamla ul arda adlan kama muli a jawra. That Allah will through you grant this individual who will fill the earth with justice and equity as it has been filled with deception with evil and wrong that's why this lady is indeed noble for the fact that she also gave birth not only to imam al-askari but to a number of other righteous individuals especially a person that many of us do ziyara to when we go to samarra people today when they go with caravans or groups they often stop in balad when they stop in balad they visit who Sayyid Muhammad, he's known. Sab'ul Dujail. Sayyid Muhammad, an outstanding son of an Imam. He's the son of Imam al Hadi and the son of Hudayf, Sulayl, yes, or Salil. This great individual was the oldest son of Imam al Hadi. And many people thought that he will be the Imam after Imam al Hadi. He was so noble, he is such a, considered a scholar, he could not join his father when Imam al Hadi was forced to go from Medina to Surra Man Ra'a, otherwise known as Samarra. He joined him later. He was very close to Imam al Askari. It is likely that he was assassinated when he left. He was only in his 20s 
when he left Samarra to go back to Medina on his way, Balad is only 50 kilometers away from Samarra. He passed by Balad, he stopped there, he fell sick and he died there. They buried him there and many would go and pay respects to him because they recognize there is what? There is karamat, there is fadl for Sayyid Muhammad. He's known as Sab'ud Dujail. Why? Sab'ud means the lion. Dujail was an area five kilometers away from Balad. It is said that many Zawar used to go to visit Sayyid Muhammad's shrine and what? There were thieves, bandits. There was a lion that would sit there, protect the Zawar. And that's why this was a miracle people saw and they would refer to him as Muhammad yes, Sab'ul Dujayl, a great individual, a noble son of Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. Yes, and we have others, but unfortunately Imam al-Hadi also had a son by the name of Ja'far. And when Ja'far was born, the riwayah is said that Imam alayhi salam said, Innahu sayadullu khalqan kathira. He will deviate a number of people. And he, Imam al-Hadi, would warn about him. He says, تَجَنَّبُوا جَعْفَرَا فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلَةِ نَمْرُودَ مِنْ نُوحِ We know we have a hadith of manzila in Ya Ali, أَنْتَ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلَةِ هَارُونَ مِنْ مُوسَى Imam al-Hadi says, my son Ja'far to me is like Namrud to Nuh. What was the story? You all know. Quran says, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكْ إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٍ I am... Apologizing for the rush because there's so much to cover in half an hour. But just to tell you the fact that Namrud, yes, was a son of Nuh. Nuh alayhi salam would say, how come my son is being punished? Uh, Quran says he's not from your family. Similarly, Ja'far was the son of Imam al-Hadi. He was a wretched individual. In which way? He claimed Imam. After what? After Imam al-Askari, he would claim Imam. After Imam al-Hadi, he would claim Imam. Similarly, he was the one who informed the Abbasids to attack the house of Imam al-Askari to ransack the house of Imam al-Askari He was responsible for the arresting of Sayyidah Narjah sallallahu alayha because he told the authorities she'd given birth to an individual who would be the 12th Imam. Yes, this is who Ja'far. He was a drunkard individual who left Salah. And he would go to Al-Mu'tamid al-Abbasi's wazir, yes, and he would say to him, why don't you make me the Imam of the Shia? I'll give you 20,000 dinars. The wazir said to him, are you crazy? We are not the ones who make the Imams of the Shia. Yes, the Shia themselves are the ones who recognize who the Imam is and they gather around him. You have no basis for us to make you the Imam of the Shia. This Ja'far al kadhab was an individual who hurt his mother a lot, who stood against his mother, Hudayth. Hudayth later, when she came back, she was in Medina. When she came back to Samarra, this man had taken all of her property. She went to the judge. She said, I am the wife of Al-Hasan ibn Ali. And I am the one who is in charge of my affairs. The judge ruled in her favor against her own son, Ja'far. Sometimes today, parents will be despaired when sometimes they try their best for their sons and daughters, but things don't work out. As long as you try your effort and utmost um, concern and plan from early stages. If things don't work out, then don't lose hope, number one. But number two, don't always blame yourself. If God forbid your son or daughter has gone astray, we have examples from the lives of the Imam Ali Salam. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, his, his son was is called Zaydun Nar. Yes, Zaydun Nar, Imam ja Ali ibn Musa would say to him, How can you kill people indiscriminately? He says, I'm the son of Musa ibn Ja'far. I'm your brother, we are going to Jannah. Imam Ridha would warn him and say, that's nonsense. It's just because you are the son of an Imam doesn't save you, yes? Similarly, the same case can be applied to whom? To this individual who's known as Ja'far al kadhab But without shadow of a doubt, a great moment of celebration for this lady, Hudayf, was when she gave birth to the 11th holy Imam, Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. This was in the year 232, either 8th of the month of Jamad al or Rabi al Akhar or the 10th. There are two different narrations and they're observed in two different ways when it comes to his illustrious birth. What we find, however, when it comes to this particular lady and her noble status was the fact that she was the individual who accompanied Imam al Hadi alayhi salam to Samarra. Now, this did not occur for all the Mothers of the Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes they stayed. Yes. For example, we find Lady Khayzuran. Khayzuran, she stayed where? She stayed in Medina when her husband, Imam al-Ridha went to 
Mashhad, most likely. She stayed with Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam, no doubt. Yet, this honorable lady accompanied Imam al-Hadi towards where? Towards Samarra. When she accompanied her husband, she noticed the miracles because Imam al-Hadi said to them, said to his wife, I want you to prepare something that protects us from strong hail. So Lady Hudayf, she would go and prepare this for a number of days when a man by the name of Yahya ibn Harthama comes from Samarra and commands Imam al-Hadi to leave at the order of Mutawakkil al-Abbasi. So what happened was Lady Hudayf and the other women of the Ahl al-Bayt, they began to prepare something. Why? Because on the way, this Yahya ibn Harthama was where? Was in a desert. He and his soldiers were waiting there. He looks at one of the Shia that was there amongst his army. He said, you have imams. What do your imams say? This is one of the things my imams say, is that every place on this earth will be a grave. Every place will be eventually a grave for someone. He says, look at this. This Sahara, this desert is not a grave. How can you say this has a grave? Yes, he laughed at him. He went to Medina. Imam al-Hadi said, give us a few days after they were prepared. They were what? Setting off to Samarra. When they reached that same area, there was a heavy hailstorm to the extent that a number of the soldiers of Mutawakkil, this Yahya ibn Harthama died, and they were buried just there. Imam Ali Salam comes to him and says, now you believe that there will be graves everywhere? Lady Hudayf, Salil, she sees this, she recognizes this. Of course, she would know the status of her husband, the status of her son, no doubt. They go towards Samarra. Extremely difficult situation in Samarra. Yes? Because the Imam Ali Salam is unable to what maneuver, the Imam is taken for inter for a number of times for interrogation, intimidated. Many a times his Shia arrested, placed in dungeons, placed in what places like prisons. Imam Ali Salam himself, Imam Al Hassan Ali Salam Al Askari. Why is he known as Askari? Because he was placed in a military camp. So Lady Hudayf went through a, a very difficult time for the Shia. A very what, uh, um, uh, oppressive time for the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt until of course she had to witness and see the martyrdom of her own husband Imam al-Hadi Afterwards Imam al-Askari did something tremendously important. Something which you and I need to understand very carefully, yes, and appreciate in the life of this great lady because it's a contemporary discussion regarding the position of females in Islam. Imam al-Askari came forward. He did two things when it comes to his mother, Hudayf. Number one, in the year 259 after Hijra, he gave her, according to some riwayat, by the way, he gave her whom? He gave her the holy 12th Imam. May Allah hasten his reappearance. When he was how many? Four years of age. He said to her that I would like you to take him to Mecca and look after him there. This is something maybe most people don't know. They thought that the Imam Ali Salam, Imam Al Mahdi, Allah Taala Faraja, was born in Samarra. Yes, we said a few nights ago, if you are paying attention, yes, and not worrying whether tomorrow is meatballs or not. Yes, the idea is what the idea is that uh, Imam Al Sajjad was born in Kufa, and Imam Al Mahdi was born in Samarra. Everyone else of the Imma was born in Medina Al Munawwara or Mecca. We are told what. We are told that Imam al-Askari said to his mother Hudayf, you take my son and you go to Mecca. You look after him there, subhanAllah. This is a major responsibility that he entrusted his mother. That's why she would be known as Al-Jadda. Yes, Al-Jadda means the grandmother, the one who is also responsible for bringing up Imam al-Mahdi and that was a special fadila of this great lady that she was honored by the Ahl al-Bayt despite being what according to the people of that time a slave, a slave who was freed, yes. a woman because at that time not only were females looked down upon but also slaves but Imam al-Hadi what is an, setting an example for the empowerment of females in Islam number one by saying you Take her, take him, and are responsible for his upbringing in Mecca. Yes, she takes him for about a year, approximately, according to historical narrations. And we are told what that she comes back just at the time of the martyrdom of Imam al Askari. That's number one. Number two, very importantly, what did Imam do? Imam السلام, said that the person after me who rules the affairs of the Shia and the Shia come to for questions, 
for direction is who? My mother Hudayf. He said, my mother is now going to rule the Shia. And this is an Iwaya, this is a number of indications in historical records, yes. A man by the name of what? A man by the name of Ahmad ibn Ibrahim. He says, I came to Hakima, salamullahi alayha, the daughter of whom? Imam al-Jawad, yes. Hakima, the daughter of Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam. Hakima was very much present in the time of the birth of Imam alayhi salam, which we'll discuss inshallah tomorrow and what happened thereafter. Yet she was an individual who declared this. This man, Ahmed ibn Ibrahim, comes and says, who is the person leading the Shia after, after whom? After Imam al-Askari. She said, whom? She said, this lady, Hudayf, his own mother, Salil. He said, how is this possible? A lady leads us? How is this acceptable? Hakim, look at the answer. She said, after Sayyid al-Shuhada, who was leading the affairs for the captives? Sayyid Zainab. Yes? This does not mean that Sayyid Zainab has a higher status than Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, nor Hudayf or Salil has a higher status than 12th Imam. But it was needed at that time due to the importance of concealing the, the existence of Imam al-Mahdi, ajallah ta'ala farajah. Similarly, at that time, and then, of course, the ulama discuss what Imam Sadiq did. You may recall or not, yes, that Imam Sadiq had five people who would be people that take on the reins after him. One of them was his own, what? Wife, Hamida al Musaffat. Do you agree? Hamida al Musaffat, the governor of Medina, his son Abdullah, his son Musa ibn Ja'far, as well as Mansur al Duaniqi. Imam Sadiq knew. That Mansur said, anyone who is the, the representative of uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq, kill him. Yes. Similarly, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam would entrust his mother to be what? To be dealing with the affairs of the Shia. This is an outstanding what? position for this great lady to actually acquire. And it highlights an important question when it comes to discussing the role of females within the school of Ahl al-Bayt. Isn't it? Because today there is an increasing analysis or idea with regards to what do females and the role of women that they play in society, especially when it comes to challenges we face with regards to misconceptions and myths about how Islam deals with females. No doubt there are many who have come across narrations that exist that unfortunately depict females in a negative light. Narrations that our ulama have looked at, narrations that have scrutinized and analyzed, and the fact that many of them do not in any shape or form conform with the Holy Quran, many narrations have indeed been rejected or interpreted in a different way so that they are not necessarily what understood in any shape or form to mean that females are, superior, uh, are inferior to males. But uh, someone asks the question, what does this mean to the discussion regarding the role of females in Islam? And what is it that's needed to empower females in accordance with Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt? This is an important subject. In the spirit of understanding Lady Hudayf, there are five points that I would like to quickly mention so that the discussion is not only historical, because I'm aware that sometimes a historically uh, uh, confined discussion may not be something that people will necessarily want to take away. But rather, lessons that we can learn from this great lady, five points into how we can empower our ladies when it comes to our own community, when it comes to their position within the religion of Islam. Number one, and that is when it comes to self-confidence and what? And the respect shown to females in Islam. This is an important area to start off with. What do we mean? Today, sadly, there is a bad trait. A set of unfortunate events happening on social media that depicts that some of our ladies, especially ladies who wear hijab, have a sense of inferiority complex or the need to be recognized, the need to get the likes, the need to be praised, because perhaps the fathers are not praising them, the husbands are not praising them, the brothers are not praising them. There isn't the emphasis about what? The empowerment through hijab, the liberation through the Islamic dress code of modesty and chastity. So what do you find? You find some of them, God forbid, are coming out with these music videos wearing their hijab. Yes? Or some of them are coming out in TikTok and in, on the Instagram and other places depicting themselves in a manner which is what? 
which is not befitting of a female wearing hijab because the spirit of hijab is to protect themselves, is to not draw people's attention towards themselves, isn't it? And that's why you find some of them are going ahead with makeup tutorials on YouTube and so on and so forth. This highlights a problem, yes? It highlights a problem with this celebrity culture, the idea of these hijabi stylists that, for example, for a few years, they tell people how to wear hijab, and all of a sudden, they've taken off their hijab. And a number of them exist, and probably the sisters know what I'm talking about, yes? The idea today, these are challenges. We need to speak about them. We need to highlight what is the reason why this is happening. The Quran comes forward and says, If you want dignity, if you want honor, if you want recognition, that belongs to Allah. And Allah says, Allah gives special dignity, honor, and prestige towards believers, yes? And therefore, the more an individual holds on to the religion of Islam and the teachings of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, the more they're empowered with that dignity and honor. That power from Allah, ta'ala, not from the people, not from the likes, not for, oh, you look amazing. Yes, that is one important area. The second area is there are a number of misconceptions that exist in the mindset of some of our sisters, as well as brothers. Some come forward and say 124,000 prophets. Why don't we have a single one of them who's female? Some come forward and say, for example, why is it that we don't hear enough about female role models? Hence the choice of this subject, which may not be for majority of the people, their cup of tea in the month of Ramadan. But we have to have these discussions. We have to present these role models, whether people like it or not. I could not find a single series in English in the whole of YouTube and anywhere, anyone talking about the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt. We need to have these discussions in order for people to recognize that there are these great role models for both males and females when it comes to what? When it comes to uh, exemplars for people to follow. Similarly, if there are no females who are prophets, there are many females who made prophets. Yes? There are many females who are great individuals that were incredibly supportive for the existence of these what great cho chosen individuals from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, we need seminars. We need discussion circles. We need journals and books and videos and whatever it takes to highlight and discuss all the issues to do with fiqh, for example, that many have concerns about. For example, why should a female get half the inheritance of a male? For example, the issues of divorce. Why is it that the husband has the right of divorce, the wife doesn't? And these matters, they need to be discussed. We need to have an open discussion. We are not fearful of anything. We are not fearful of, lack, uh, of a backlash of anyone. We must present it in a way that's understood. If people are not convinced, that's not our concern. The concern is to have these meaningful discussions so that they're not brushed under the carpet. Number three, of great importance for the empowerment of ladies, Lesson to be learned from Hudayf, she was an alima, she was a muhaditha, she was a narrator of hadith, and that is, like I said before, encouraging sisters to take up hawza, to take up institutions of learning, so that today and in the future we have many alimas, we have many of these great scholars. Now, question within this is, can we have a lady who is a marja? This requires an in-depth discussion, but I'm going to summarize how an opinion exists today, yes? And that is, many of our ulama and fuqaha say, yes, a female can be a mujtahida or a mujtahid. Meaning what? Reaches the late stage of ijtihad. For example, this great lady, Nusrat Amin, who died in the 80s. She used to teach ulama. She used to give them ijazah for ijtihad. Yes. Allama Tabatra used to go to her and learn from her. Nusrat Amin, yes? We haven't done enough justice to our ladies in the history, honestly. This name may be alien to you, yes? But the recognition is these ladies existed, some of the daughters, wives of these great ulama, Allama Majlisi and others, yes? Similarly, what do we find? We find the discussion is, yes, they can reach ijtihad, but can they become a marja, followed by people or not? The general idea today is no. Why? They say because as far as interaction is concerned, some of the ulama have said, look, a female can't lead males in salah, so how could she lead them as far as ifta? or the idea of giving fatwas and sitting with them and so on is concerned. Yet this is now being challenged. Ayatollah Sheikh Ishaq Fayyad, Hafizahullah, is of the opinion that a lady can be a marja. Why? 
because many other ulama are also coming to this conclusion. They're saying there isn't any indication in Quran and Sunnah that prohibits this from happening. And today we live in a technologically advanced world. Yes, even if you're concerned about interaction, which is not a problem if it's done in a modest way, today a marja can what? Lead through online interactions, no doubt. Doesn't limit them in any shape or form, yes? To give istifta, to give rulings in that way. So that cannot be used as a reason, yes? And the Quran gives us example of what? Of females leading communities like the Queen of Sheba, yes? The Queen of Sheba, the Quran tells us, does not condemn the Queen of Sheba for leading them. And if it was a problem for a lady to lead a community, we might have had an issue with this or the Quran somehow insinuating this. And the fact that Lady Hudayth was placed as an individual who could, who was potentially guiding the Shia after Imam al-Askari alayhi salam is a great example of a potential for a female to become a marja. And this is a discussion that's ongoing, yes, in the seminary circles, a healthy discussion that is what, that is inshallah developing. The fourth area of the empowerment of ladies of great importance is culture issues, sometimes the development that we'd like to see as far as how females are treated within the religion of Islam is hindered because of cultural sensitivities. Culture is very important. Culture is something that we need in our lives. But sometimes we place culture over religion. And this placing of the culture over religion hinders development of our communities as well as personal growth. And examples of this exist when it comes to marriage, for example. Yes, marriage, sometimes some of our ladies are hindered. When I did a survey to find out online why so many over 30 ladies within our many different communities are not married, I found some shocking reasons that some people gave. For example, they say, my father says no. The reason my father says no is because I am the second daughter and my, my older sister is not married. So how can I get married when I found someone when my other sister is not married? Things like this. And the idea of Sayyid, non-Sayyid marriages, Allahu Akbar, doesn't affect this community much, so I won't talk about it. Yes? This and many other things, where is religion and where is culture? Yes? In this idea that we need discussion in, the, in this regard. And fifth, we need to encourage more female speakers, politicians, leaders, yes, people out there, more involvement, and I know this is sensitive, more female participation, in mosque committees, not only for the leader, for the lady to be there in charge of women's affairs. Why should there only be one female in a mosque committee? Why? This is sensitive, I know, yes? But these discussions need to take place in order for us to show that there is growth, there is development in this regard. Finally, this honorable lady, this honorable lady Hudayth, what is it about her? One thing that is indeed quite interesting is that she passed away after the year 274 after Hijrah because we're told she passed away after Lady Hakima. When she passed away after Lady Hakima, we are told that they bought her body to be buried next to Imam al-Hadi, next to Imam al-Askari in Samarra. Who said, no, I don't want her to be buried here? Allahu Akbar. It's incredible. Her son Jafar. His son Ja'far said, I want my mother to be buried next to these two individuals. The riwayah tells us the moment he said this, the holy 12th imam was in the, what, minor occultation. He emerges and he says to him, Adaruka here? Is this your house for you to say this? He just said these two words. Adaruka here? Is this your house? The moment they saw Imam al-Mahdi, May Allah hasten his reappearance, he steps aside, just like how he stepped aside when it comes to the prayer over the body of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. And that's why when you go to Samarra, remember Lady Hudayth, because although her grave is not identified as one of the four, she's buried in that area. Yes, she's buried next to Hakima and Narjis and Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Askari, salamullahi alayhim ajma'in. Very briefly, the uh, spiritual tip, and that is in sajda, we are told that one of the best dhikr to humble our hearts, gain proximity to Allah, and understand our nothingness before our Creator is what's known as a dhikrul yunusi. To say in sajda, La ilaha illa ant, subhanaka inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen. Repeat this a few times during the day in sajda, because this is what Prophet Yunus alayhi salam apparently said 
inside the belly of the whale and sajda, I say apparently. He definitely said it inside the belly of the whale. But he was in three levels of darknesses, you know. Darknesses is plural. Light is singular. Yes. He was inside the belly of the whale, inside the sea, and it was at night. And when you and I are in, in, in the position of hardship, you know, difficulty, when we see no light, go in sajda and say this. Why? Because the Quran says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ غَمْ means hardship. We responded to him, got him out of difficulty. And then what? وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Same thing, we will save the believers. And that is highly encouraged and recommended. We don't have time, unfortunately, for the fiqh reminder. We'll save it for tomorrow. May Allah bless you and accept your deeds with the barakah of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.